on to Madam Odo Mikimani to just share with us uh, her perspective on an ideal criminal justice system. Thank you and good morning everybody. I apologize for coming late. I was uh, held up in something else. Um, first of all, let me extend my, my sincere gratitude for inviting us to this session. This is a topic which, on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General, that we hold very dearly. Because, as you know, the Attorney General is in charge of the criminal justice policy and reports on behalf of the Republic in terms of our institutions and the status of the justice sector. So it's, an, it's a topic that I have been handling for the last um, two years, and I appreciate that... Um, uh, ICJ and the organizers have thought, found it fit to bring us together because one of the things that I have seen is that, of course, as a country in Kenya, we are under obligations to ensure that we meet the UN standards and norms, and which, um, of course, if you look at the UN standards and norms, there are various issues which are flagged out there. Of course, there is the treatment of prisoners and the prison reforms and uh, standard minimum rules otherwise known as the Mandela Rules, and of course the Bangkok Rules for the women, treatment of women and prison health and all the various other aspects which all come in there. Of course, human rights is always at the fore because of uh, the very nature and the conventions that we have signed up to. But uh, I think even juvenile, all these things are there, including child uh, online uh, predators protection, online protection, exploitation protection, all those things are there, and restorative justice, and of course I didn't hear your speech, but I do know that there is a lot, and even uh, how long you can hold a person in detention, and the rights of the detained person, and I think we had a discussion with you, and the committee, and the victims as well. So all these things are reforms that we have to ensure that we have, we look at what is set at the basic minimum standards in the UN, and then come up as a country, in my view, we must come up as a country to have a, an overall national strategy where we look at where are we in terms of this standard. Then we say which are our priorities, where are the low-hanging fruits, because my problem right now is that I find there are various pieces of legislation which are coming up, there are various initiatives initiated either by private parties or the technical institutions without reference to the overall national agenda and which then means that when we go to reporting we then have a problem because we may have done very well but we are not seen as doing very well so my view is that um, having because the attorney general is in charge of the rule of law the attorney general should we should sit together as the, the, the various stakeholders in the criminal justice sit together and come up with an overall strategy because of course it's not possible to implement the Mandela rules to the very <coughs> basic detail because we don't have the resources to require resources it will require planning it will require budget it will require uh, 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 personnel and other resources and I think the basic ones we look for is what is going to get us uh, the, the mark so that people can come to this country and say we are a country that is a modern criminal, modern, modern developing nation or developed nation? Because one of the challenges uh, that we have is like when we were, when uh, Bishop Dare's extradition proceedings to Kenya came up, of course, one of the issues is that he says that Kenyan prisons are not fit, they are below standards. And you can imagine that is what is holding Dare out there. Otherwise, if we had been able to demonstrate properly, because the prisons, unfortunately, let me tell you from point of knowledge, is that people don't trust the institutions. So we've got to bring back that faith and trust so that even the criminals out there, because they spoil our name, we are able to bring them. Even exchange of prisoners, we are supposed to have certain standards. I know with diet, I know you've done a lot in terms of the reforms, diet and treatment of prisoners, but uh, without... A strategy where we're able to communicate internationally without a strategy where we're able to show that we have moved from the old days when we said prison is not a hotel but because the rights of the prisoners are still domain in the prisoners even when they're in the prisons we are able to say that okay it's not a five star but it is with the basic minimum rights that every Kenyan is entitled to so I would say that um, my my view is that we have to get all these things right and criminal justice uh, before i end is not just about prison reforms criminal justice involves all the sectors that have a role in the criminal justice chain 
This includes having an independent and impartial judiciary that is able to hear cases uh, expeditiously and, uh, and be able to determine justice within the law so that justice is predictable. It is not, you don't have, and, and I see a lot of, of course, efforts towards this by the judiciary, uh, towards the guiding principles on bail sentencing policy, which is then bringing us uh, the, the, at the fore to show that there is no, 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 uh, no disparity in the way you sentence and treat suspects or, or convicts. So those are the things that we have to do. We also have to deal with um, the issues of, of governance in terms of the institutions, because all these are domain and all these are things that we have to answer. So to round it up, I would only say that uh, I hope the deliberations here will be able to, uh, to guide us to coming up with a, a resolution. I don't know if you would call it a resolution, because if you look at what, what came out last year at the UN General Assembly, the adoption of the Doha resolution, which says, of course, there cannot be any sustainable development without the rule of law, crime prevention, and criminal justice. These are things that we, as a nation, have to come up with strategies. We have to come up with a work plan, and we have to engage all the institutions that are involved to ensure that we come up with something that we are proud as Kenyans. I don't think any one of us should sit back and say, I'm the prison, I am the judiciary, I am the prosecutor. We should all stand up and say we are Kenyans and change the narrative about Kenya. I don't believe Kenya is as bad as the narrative that is out there. I believe there are some good things which we can build on so that we can get back our place in the world. So thank you very much. And I also wear another hat before I end up. The hat I wear is the hat of the director of, of assets recovery, which I always, when I have an occasion, it, I don't like to appear on, on the press on it because, as you know, it is a security issue. But I always, when I meet, uh, when I have an occasion, I like to mention to the public and Kenyan stakeholders that you all have a stake in assisting us as the Assets Recovery Agency, telling us where are these assets hidden. The assets you and I know, most Kenyan assets are within the Kenyan territory, and it is for us to ensure that crime doesn't pay, crime should never pay, and sh must never pay, so that if we take away the assets from the criminals, from the suspects, and from the perspective I come from, we recover them based forfeiture, which is not confiscation, it's not based on, on there is conviction. It is forfeiture based on these are proceeds of crime. All I need to do is to ensure there is an investigation or there is a prosecution ongoing and the evidential burden shifts. This is not against the constitution and like what some people are saying because it goes before a court of law. There is the judge who is always there and due process is followed. And the owners, once it shifts, it's upon the person having the asset to come and demonstrate that this is not a product or, or a proceed of crime. And it is a hard task because, as you know, Kenyans are always trying things. But that is not to tell you that uh, we have succeeded, you know. But please tell us, support us. We support me and Undari, and you have a crime-free, and we'll be able to develop. And the resources that are being taken away from Kenyans uh, distorting the economy, distorting everything, will be put back where, where they should be in terms of the reform agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam uh, Muloni. As I was listening to you, I, I was also thinking, I know the Kenya Prison Service has been on the reform trajectory for many years, and I think we should hear them out uh, on uh, their vision on an ideal criminal justice system, what challenges they are facing, what are their current priorities. And I know it is quite a challenge to manage our penitentiary system. So, Karibu Sana, sir. Thank you. Morning, colleagues. My name is Masharia. I'm an Assistant Commissioner General of Prisons. Um, from the word go, my vision for an ideal criminal justice system is one that delivers, one that is seen to be delivering, either individually or collectively, as a result of which people 
have confidence in it. People can trust it. Madam Kimani already talked about some of our agencies, including prisons, not being trusted, maybe because they have not been understood. They don't know what we do. They don't know what it means to go through what we go through. They don't know what we have achieved uh, over time. So that would be my, my opening. But uh, moving on, I would like to see a system where agencies are, you know, collaborating, where we see synergies producing information that would be used to make proper decisions, decisions that would enhance our operations because they would be informed by, you know, the right information, not really, you know, suspicion. Um, we have come from very far as an institution, and this many people who have interacted with us recently, like uh, you know, Janet was saying, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you wouldn't knock at the door at prisons and say, I'm, I'm human rights. Human rights are happy. Unakuja kufanya jela kitu gani. Eh? The way we used to treat our inmates, the way we used to interact with the various publics, has completely, completely changed. To the extent that today, any individual with good intentions, especially with a legal parking, all those who want to partner with us, you can just walk in and walk out any prisons and make an inquiry, whatever inquiry you want to make, without having to be cleared by prisoners' headquarters, like it was there before. A number of colleagues in this room, I, I believe, would attest to that. In terms of the way we have provided for our inmates generally, starting from uh, clothing, uh, the, the, the diet, the accommodation, the, the way we transport them, there has been a lot of, a lot of change. Of course, a lot more still needs to be done. But you can proudly say we have a, we have a story to tell in, 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 that, in that field. The way we also train our, our inmates, the way we prepare them for uh, eventual reintegration back to society, the way we have uh, diversified and strengthened our training programs, a recent uh, example is uh, this guy who graduated in a, a doctorate in uh, veterinary medicine just the other day. Uh, you know, earlier than that, you, you wouldn't imagine somebody saying he's, he's going to school in prison. Because they believe was people go to prison <laughs> to be harassed. I don't want to use a stronger word than that. To be harassed. Which again was not the case. The role is rehabilitation of course, in safe custody. But like uh, Madame said, maybe we need to shout a little louder on what we do and what we have done and uh, the, the factors that perhaps hinder us from doing better, better than that. So I would like to see a system where agencies contained therein are collaborating and they are facilitated to enable them actualize their mandate, individually and collectively. I would hate to see a system where one unit is perhaps facilitated to be effective, and their effectiveness affects the performance of another sister agency. Just putting it generally. If we did that, I, I believe we would move much faster as individual institutions and as a, a collective called uh, the, the, the criminal justice uh, system. The one that uh, Madam uh, um, Janet uh, mentioned about the, the celebration of the International Prisoners Day, which we did celebrate at the Nairobi Remad Prison for the first time in Kenya last year, where Minister Kaiseri was a guest of honor. And we did a lot of talk. We did a lot of talk there. You remember you were there. Free talk, prisoners talking to the minister. Minister, we want this. Minister, we want even to vote. So many things. Before, <laughs> I don't know how to come back to that, but out of that interaction, the minister actually on the table 
just picked it up, called one of the members of parliament, I think, who chairs, who sits in that committee. And a few months later, like the Janet confirmed, like I confirmed practically, the mission is now back, and we will be talking about that tomorrow in the afternoon, on what it meant, what the withdrawal <coughs> meant, and what now uh, having it, uh, you know, reinstated uh, currently means. I want to start there. Thank you, Mr. Masharia. Maybe we give him a round of applause. Maybe to just a brief mention of the prison. The prison is one hotel that does not have the signage that it is full. And I remember a couple of years ago, we, we were seated in a similar meeting. And uh, the prison authorities were saying, judicial officers are making orders, we are receiving people in their hundreds, and the facilities are full. And I think that did trigger discussions, candid discussions, because uh, th these inmates or remandees are brought in on uh, court warrants, and at times the officer in charge of the facility cannot say no, but his facility is already overflowing with humanity. I wish to invite uh, the Director of Pub uh, Deputy Director of Public Prosecution, Mr. Ondari. Maybe while speaking to us, Mr. Ondari, you can also touch on uh, the, the, the economic value. I don't know whether the prosecution services in Kenya do take into consideration the cost it takes to prosecute a matter uh, because, uh, and how the priorities are then set when uh, exercising your prosecutorial policies and how then that would uh, foster further economic growth in this country. Uh, that is just my ten cent while speaking to us. Karibu. Thank you, Bwana uh, Distinguished participant, good morning again. Now, I'll pick from what uh, Mohochi and my colleagues have said here about the criminal justice system players. Uh, but Mochi, Kenya, Kenyans are very interesting people. Interesting in the sense that while you are talking about the cost of prosecution, there are people who will go to ridiculous extent of selling land to pursue a case of his or her mother's uh, chicken eating veg his vegetables. I've been to areas where people are so litigious that they want to have their mother jailed because her goat ate his vegetables. Those are the Kenyans. And at the moment you say you are not going to prosecute this is a petty offense. The next thing you hear is that you have been compromised. I'm aggrieved that you have to have this person prosecuted. So, so the, the, the situation is really so complex at times that you have no choice but to apply the test that we usually apply to either decide whether to prosecute a case or not to prosecute. I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about that later in the day in my presentation. But I wanted you to understand that uh, Kenyans are interesting people. They want you to go to jail because it is you. When it comes to him now, going to jail, they will fight as hard as possible to ensure they don't go to jail. So, mkuki kwa ngurue, kwa binadamu ni chungu. So, so long as it's not you, Kenyans will want to have you go to jail. We are going to talk about bail and bond and all this. Do you know that people who are aggrieved in Kenya will not want the accused person to get out on bond? Even in the current constitutional dispensation, they don't want. The moment you, a person gets out on bond, or the state council, prosecutor goes and concedes application for bond because somebody is said to have stolen one goat. The other person is up in arms. This person has been released. He stole my goat or he did my this and this. So, so, so that you, you, we are normally torn in between opposing bond or conceding uh, uh, release on bond. 
it is a very complex situation, which, uh, as, as we'll engage later in the day, uh, we'll see. Having said that, I would want to uh, actually quite agree with my earlier panelists here, Ms. Mudoni and uh, uh, Wawel, Mashari, sorry, from the prison. Uh, I, would, I would want to agree with what Madam Mudoni said. We need to have harmony in the way we do things, in the way we make laws. Quite often, the office of DPP sometimes is surprised to realize a law has been passed which impacts on the prosecution service. And you realize that we were never even consulted at all. Each justice player develops his own law or piece of legislation, they push it through, Another one comes up with a piece of legislation, they push it through. So at the end of the day, you have two or three pieces of legislation which almost deal with the same thing and all are in conflict with each other. So that we will need to have a, 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 a discussion together, <coughs> a conversation, all of us in the criminal justice system, so that we agree what is the national uh, strategy on some of this legislation, because some of them uh, are, are so complex that you are not even able to enforce the legislation because whoever was passing or pushing for that legislation was only thinking along his line. You heard the other day the Ministry of Interior pushing the security laws and the laws were passed. Now they, we, people were back in court and we the Attorney General, the DPP, had now to start defending particular provisions, sections of the law, which would have been ironed out or at least put in particular uh, way to avoid such uh, contest in courts. This impacts, of course, negatively on the country and also enforcement of the, the law. Of course, as uh, uh, my colleague from prison has said, uh, the prison conditions have changed. Even the criminal justice system has changed in this country. I remember about uh, eight years ago when we had an upsurge of piracy in this country and uh, no, not this country, this region the, off the coast of Somalia. There was, a, a, there was a, a scramble from Europe. Talk about Germany sending people to come and now take over cases because they did not believe the criminal justice system in Kenya works. We had UNODC, we had UK, we had US and all these uh, 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 European countries coming over and trying to assess the Kenyan situation to see whether we are able to uh, try criminal offenses, uh, particularly where the pirates are interdicted or arrested by the, the, the naval forces, the naval forces in the Indian Ocean of the coast of Somalia, until they were satisfied now that our criminal justice system is not as bad as they thought, and they left one by one, and we never had any complaint. In fact, they assisted us to have maybe refurbished the prison because they were thinking of UN standards in Shimola Tower. Uh, but the, the lawyers who are coming here, of course they came with two aims. One, to make a kill because they thought piracy was there to stay. And number two, because they thought uh, the, standard, the, the prosecution standard in Kenya cannot match what was expected. But they were surprised. Out of the, the, the 19 cases, we only lost one case. This involves about 240 uh, uh, pirates, and all the cases have been concluded. <coughs> Nobody raised their finger that there was injustice somewhere, and there was maybe uh, oppression of uh, the pirates or, or mistreatment of the pirates anywhere. Uh, of course, when we talk of uh, efficient criminal justice system, we normally tend to look more of, uh, of, on the side of the accused persons and the, the convicts and forget also the prison warders. I don't know whether you have prison quarters. <laughs> I see, I see uh, police quarters. We have police quarters, we have 
nice buildings coming up nowadays. I've not seen prison quarters. You find that sometimes the prisoner, the, the prison warders, are living in worse conditions than the prisoners. But this must be very patient people. Because I've not had, uh, of course it's not been very common hearing a prison warder shooting himself and shooting other people. But I've heard of police, uh, policemen shooting people and shooting themselves and shooting everybody on site. Because of the frustrations, when the conditions under which they live and operate, it, it is also for it to, uh, the system to work better. I think the government and the country need to come up with a strategy on how to address also the conditions of the prison. I'm not saying that the prison conditions are good or, or, or the standard, international standard, but we're trying. In other countries, you go, you find a prison which is a, a, like a, a, a three-star hotel where I was told, I've been to some place in, in, in Germany where when Africans are arrested, they will want to go there and be arrested. Why? Because so long as you are in prison, you are earning money equivalent to a thousand shillings a day for the little work you do for yourself and cleaning around there. So that at the end of the month, you are earning about 40,000 Kenya shillings and you are eating a, a three-star meal. The hospital having all the amenities that you can think of, a hospital, in fact, more serious than Nairobi Hospital, with maternity wing, with the theater, physiotherapy, and everything. We, we, we are yet to reach there because we are struggling with the little resources we have, some people are preferring it. It's the same resource we are looking up to put up a prison uh, uh, quarter for the, the prison warders and so on and so forth. So it, it is something we need to work on. The police, of course, for us to have an efficient criminal justice system, we need uh, serious investigative techniques. We, we need, for example, a forensic laboratory. Of course, the one which was about to be uh, to be brought around here was fraught with uh, uh, many issues and corruption allegations, and of course, is the subject of cases in court. But we need a forensic laboratory like yesterday, because many of these uh, uh, suspects are going scot free because we are using the archaic investigative techniques, where you have to see somebody before you can convict. You have to have physical material for you to be able to have a suspect convicted. <coughs> this impacts, of course, negatively on the criminal justice system because the people know that so and so commit. The Kenyans sometimes are very interesting also. They know so and so committed the offense, but they don't want to go to testify. But when the, once the person is, accu is, is released, they start accusing the judiciary, they accuse everybody else other than themselves. You, you see, if we had other techniques, like uh, DNA and all these other things which we can easily uh, uh, prove a case, it would help a lot than having some uh, suspects acquitted only for them to be lynched. There was a time when there was an upside in, in, the, in the acquittals, particularly uh, around the year 2007 and eight there, when there was a court of appeal decision that anybody who has been held in custody for more than uh, 14 days is clean, no matter the evidence. I prosecuted one case, I felt very, very bad, it was very painful for me. A case which I proved the police did an excellent job, they went to Tanzania to get the suspects. On the way, of course, from Tanzania coming this way, they have to keep him here, him there, and of course, he was held for more than uh, 14 days. In fact, it was about 20 days. Despite the strength of the evidence, this person was acquitted. I tried arguing very hard before the judge then that this person has a remedy under Section 72, then of the, uh, the old Constitution, the retired Constitution, Section 72, Subsection 6. He can sue for damages even from prison. He can get damages, but it does not mean that the person is clean because he was held beyond 14 days. The judge will hear none of it. Only for the Court of Appeal later on to make an about turn and agree with my sentiment then. 
But by then, a number of people had gone out. And a number of them had been lynched. In fact, where I come from, some suspect will be acquitted, but they refused. They said, I don't want to go. Because they knew what awaited them there. We don't want such system. We don't want such criminal trial system. We want a system where the right person is in prison, where we have fair trial, not a lynch mob. Here, you hear people uh, suspected of, 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 of an offense, and uh, even before investigation is complete, they are wondering why the person is not in prison. Kenyans are, are, are fond of lynching people before even they hear the, the, the accused person, or the suspects. It may be that it, it, it is, there was reasonable suspicion or there was some, some sort of suspicion, but the Kenyans want this person in jail, but they, they, they don't want to testify. Many of them don't want to testify. But again, those who testify, there is also the problem of the justice, the will of justice, which grinds again very slowly. And that calls, of course, on the judiciary and the government to ensure that we have enough, uh, enough magistrates to ensure an efficient criminal justice system, we need enough judges, we need enough magistrates. Yesterday I was talking to a magistrate who says now they are taking dates in June. So if a person is charged today or an adjournment is given today, the next case time you will be heard or your case can be heard is June. And of course after June, the next time will be next year, uh, 2017. Of course, uh, all the players need to be facilitated the DPP also needs to be facilitated. The government has really assisted because in 2011, when the office of the DPP was being delinked de de from the office of the Attorney General, we are a baby of the Attorney General, we were 93 council. And we are the people now who used to ap apply for adjournment because we were not able to prosecute these cases. Now, four years down the line, we are 657 prosecution counsel. Now it is the advocates asking for adjournment because they are not ready to, to meet us. Because we have now been able to cover quite substantially a number of courts. And uh, of course recently, about two, one month ago, all the police were withdrawn from prosecution service. But it's something we expected. We are taking proactive measures to at least ensure that uh, we do not disrupt uh, prosecution. But we want a system where there is efficient uh, prosecution system, efficient uh, co collaboration between the players, so that it is not just about the, uh, the, uh, the DPP, it's not just about the AG on, on asset recovery. You know, if we, as, as my colleague said, if you empower one arm of government more than the other. The others, of course, become disenchanted and feel uh, frustrated. And that's why for some long time, for the longest time, when EACC was first formed and the salaries were there, they were actually hated. Even when they went to, we went to court, magistrate hated them. The prosecution hated them. Or it's only that we had to do the case because as a matter of what? Of duty. It's because when you have the three cooking stones, we have the, the traditional stones, if one of them is missing, you can't manage. And for a long time, that is why you find a very low uh, rate of conviction in, in corruption cases. So, so I, I, I expect a system where all of us, the players, are, are working together, an efficient system where once we give, we give a date for hearing, the case takes off, and there's a time frame within which the case can be concluded, so that we don't have cases in court for 10 years. I have prosecuted a case where, which has taken two cases now. One case took 10 years to, to conclude. Even if the person is acquitted at that stage, you have already served 10 years. And incidentally, some of these people may not have been released on bond because maybe they didn't have uh, people, sureties and so on to stand for them. So they remain in custody for 10 years. So that even if the person is acquitted, 
you'd have served the, the time. So we, we want a system which is efficient where we say, for example, we come with a policy where the case has to be concluded with, between this time and this time. So that anybody who is a suspect knows that my fate will have to be decided by this time. But again, once we do that, you know Kenyans are not in a hurry to go to prison. They will always fight hard to ensure who is in a hurry to go to prison tomorrow when you can last for the next 10 years without being in prison. But we want a system which locks uh, this process and says the case has to be concluded by this time so that people don't uh, devise ways of delaying uh, these uh, cases. Of course, uh, the office of DPP is keen on that and is professionalizing all prosecution service. As I've told you, we have taken over all prosecutions all over the country in the 47 counties and 122 sub-county uh, courts. So basically, if we were facilitated, of course there are in challenges here and there because most of the people are new, the training is required for the police, the training is required for the prosecutor, and even the magistrates. There is a, a, a fallacy that magistrates are they know it all. It's not that they know everything. They need also tra to be trained on terrorism issues. They need to be trained on money laundering issues so that they can appreciate when a prosecutor or, 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 or an, an investigator who has been trained in a particular area, they can read from the same page. They understand uh, these things. It was possible for us, for example, in the piracy cases to do this because the magistrates got trained, the prosecutors got trained, and the, uh, the investigators got trained. And that's why we had a very high rate of success in those cases. We are only taking cases to court which meet the threshold, and only one, as I said, only one out of 19 cases uh, failed. So uh, uh, I, I expect, uh, as I said, it's uh, such an efficient system where all the players are working together. But we shall be engaging more and hear what you also have to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ondari. I would, uh, in light of time, I would invite uh, Madam Patricia from the Human Rights Commission to share with us a uh, vision of an ideal criminal justice system. Uh, good morning again. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my vision or the vision of KNCHR for an ideal criminal justice system is a criminal justice system that is rights-based and has as its center concern for the rights of both the victim and the accused person and that this criminal justice system is uh, deeply engaged with creating an acceptable balance uh, between uh, those two. Uh, on the rights of the victims, the criminal justice system would have as a primary concern or motivation the need to ensure that victims ensure uh, victims are guaranteed the full protection uh, of the law. <coughs> And so that we would not have a situation which unfortunately happens uh, sometimes where a certain category of victims, uh, because of failures in the system, uh, cannot uh, get justice in court. Uh, we will remember for some time, for instance, uh, victims of uh, sexual offences uh, victims of domestic violence were denied justice uh, for the simple reason uh, that our socialization uh, was that, for instance, in the case of domestic violence, uh, that, that this did not amount to a crime. Uh, it was just, uh, in some instances, a case of uh, families sorting out issues of uh, disagreements. Uh, but when you are looking at uh, and saying it's, it's a rights-based approach to justice, that means that all crimes, whether committed in the public or the private sphere, uh, victims of these crimes get, are entitled to the same uh, degree of, of, of protection. Uh, those who have been engaged in criminal justice you will know the, the struggles that victims of sexual offences 
have gone, uh, including judicial pronouncements, to the effect that it is in the nature of a woman uh, to lie about uh, sexual uh, offenses. So just discarding of such uh, prejudices, I think as Mr. Ondari has already indicated, uh, sometimes victims suffer injustice because of the inefficiencies or the, the lack of uh, advancements within the criminal justice system. So because we are dealing in an environment where crime is evolving and we are not dealing with a simple crime. So if because we do not have forensic capabilities means that uh, those who suffer crimes from advanced criminals uh, are unable to access justice, then there's a problem there. Uh, but it, it is good that when we are seeking justice, what motivates us is the sense or the need to see that these victims uh, have their, their, their rights protected and uh, safeguarded. Uh, this also extends to the kind of remedies that are afforded to victims of crime. Uh, until the coming into effect of the sentencing guidelines, uh, we had a situation where uh, the, 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 the sentence was really at the discretion of the individual judicial officer. And therefore, there was an extent to which uh, one could argue that some victims were seen to be more important victims than others, uh, because some crimes you would get away with a spunk on the hand and other crimes uh, everyone would say that really is a punishment by a court of law. So there, there needs to be a, a sense in which uh, anyone looking at our justice system is able to see that insofar as saying that uh, human rights are inalienable uh, would be able to appreciate that each uh, Kenyan uh, or person within the boundaries of Kenya uh, has a, a, a guarantee uh, that if anyone infringes on my rights, uh, the law will speak very loudly to protect my rights. With regards to accused persons, uh, one envisions a criminal justice system that is fair, transparent, and that the process is predictable. Uh, this uh, would stretch from the moment of arrest right up till uh, conviction and uh, final sentencing and touching on the if it is a, a custodial sentence even the very mode of this, uh, the, 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 the custody of that person and therefore uh, one would be looking at a system that avails uh, sufficient legal representation for accused person so that uh, they are not prejudiced by the fact that they do not have access to, to legal representation. Uh, they are not disadvantaged uh, by, by, by that. Uh, so I think it is uh, encouraging for us within Kenya uh, that we are at advanced stages of finalizing the legal uh, aid bill. Again, uh, we would put in our past instances of inhu inhuman uh, and degrading punishments and treatment uh, for accused uh, persons. Uh, uh, I don't know whether we are allowed to give our own personal experiences at a forum like this, uh, but I remember when I committed what I thought was a slight infraction of uh, traffic laws, and I found myself spending some time at a police station. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting to find that part of the process included surrendering one shoe uh, and that might not be difficult if you are wearing flat shoes, uh, but when those of us who are vertically challenged, who as a matter of habit, uh, wear heels, uh, you can imagine 
hobbling around with one heel. Uh, I found that rather dehumanizing and I didn't understand uh, why it was necessary to deprive me of one shoe because of a, a traffic of offense. Uh, what I found interesting is that uh, when I disclosed uh, who I was, uh, my shoe was quickly returned and I was scolded for not having uh, explained who I was. Uh, so the, the, the interesting thing is that it appears uh, how you are processed through the criminal justice system is also influenced by who you are. And that should not be the case. So there should be a way in which all persons who are found to have uh, breached the law are treated uh, uh, the same. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Ondari has spoken very clearly uh, that even as we seek to change circumstances for victims and accused persons, we must pay attention to the situation of those who are entrusted uh, with the responsibility of uh, uh, managing the criminal justice system. So this would include the police, the prison officers, the judges and uh, magistrates. Uh, I think a, a matter of concern is that in Kenya, we are not lucky in terms of guidelines. Uh, lots of resources uh, were dedicated both to the Ransley Commission and also to the Madoka uh, Commission that resulted in uh, those two reports. And also there was the Ouko uh, inquiry with regards to the, the judicial uh, the, 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 the judiciary. Uh, so so I, I think the, the disappointment is uh, the amount of energy that it is taking to persuade us uh, and especially the, the policy makers to implement uh, these reports. I think if there was some energy around implementing uh, those reports, we would not be struggling with this. I think there is uh, also, one can speak very broadly about the concerns of the, the larger community, uh, you know, separate from the, the victims and the accused persons, and the, their rights to a safe society, and how you guarantee that, and the role of the criminal justice system in ensuring that. I think uh, once the criminal justice system uh, is, is uh, well established, uh, then because if for one reason the deterrent effect of saying that once you commit crime, you are going to face the law, uh, that would have a deterrent effect. But increasingly in Kenya, uh, what we have seen is the, the, there is a level uh, like we are watering this plant of impunity uh, and it is it, 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 it's a very interesting one uh, because it although you know crops that are useful to us like maize you can put fertilizer and still you experience crop failure uh, with impunity it looks with the little effort you you really are guaranteed a bountiful harvest uh, so what is happening in Kenya is that we have such high levels of impunity so that you find that when people face ch uh, charges of uh, corruption, their response to it is that I am not the only one, so you cannot touch me, uh, go around and arrest the other persons. I find that very interesting. Uh, but if, uh, for instance, uh, we had a criminal justice system uh, the whose, whose back was as efficient as its bite, uh, I, I think to a great extent these issues that are troubling us uh, as Kenyans, uh, there would be none issues now uh, because you, you commit offense, an offense regardless of your stature in society uh, the, the law then handles you. I think moving forward as a country, uh, we've got to really 
uh, acknowledge the effect of corruption on our criminal uh, justice system. Uh, what it means. Uh, I know uh, as Kenyans sometimes we, we laugh at it. Uh, the other day somebody came to disconnect my water because I had delayed to pay my bill uh, and she put her spanner where I could see it. And the message from her to me was that if there was an exchange of money she would remove her spanner from her handbag and reconnect uh, my water. And she kept emphasizing to me uh, that the cost of reconnection was 1,000, uh, but that if I negotiated a figure between zero and 1,000 uh, that was acceptable to her, uh, then she would reconnect my water. Uh, because I am very good at haggling, I offered her 200. Uh, which she re rejected. I was very surprised because I thought uh, that 200 was reasonable. Uh, but she rejected my 200, uh, walked away with her spanner, <coughs> leaving me not connected to water. I had to make my way to Adam's Arcade, pay the 1,000 reconnection, and then spend a lot of money increasing the profit of Bobby Colimo. Uh, pursuing them to come and reconnect my water. And I thought, what a waste of man hours uh, because of corruption. But that, that is on a small issue. That is really on a small issue, dealing with a small Kenyan, reconnecting water. Uh, but those of us who followed the challenge uh, or the, the, the unfortunate t uh, attacks of terror and the consequences and we were hearing that some of these people came in because they were able to corrupt the people at our border points. Uh, some people are able to corrupt the guards into some facilities and then carry in the dangerous equipments. Uh, so I, I think even as we discuss the criminal justice system, we cannot possibly ignore uh, the 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 what corruption is doing towards uh, compromising the justice system uh, in recent months the judiciary has been dragged uh, you know the the, the, the supreme court uh, the honorable justice tunoi is now having to face a tribunal uh, because of allegations of corruption uh, raised against him uh, those of you who spent your 60 shillings yesterday buying the Daily Nation, uh, you were able to see that the chair of the judges and magistrates vetting board, uh, Honorable Sharad Rao, uh, said that the judiciary uh, is still steeped in corruption. Uh, and I think then if Rao is the one that is saying that about the judiciary, we can say that is author as authoritative as you can get. And uh, we can now say we need to address corruption in the judiciary and no one should challenge us to come up with evidence after that statement by uh, Sharad Rao. Uh, the other concern is the inefficiencies uh, within the criminal uh, justice system. and inefficiencies that are purely uh, man or woman made. Uh, the, if the, the fact that they are man or woman made uh, means they, they, that they are not part and parcel of the, the very structure of these institutions. So, so these must be addressed. Uh, is it because we are understaffed in the judiciary that we are fixing matters for June uh, in, in, in January or is it now in March and that now the next available dates will be in 2017. Uh, so what happened to case management within the judicial system? 
are we failing to fully utilize opportunities for diversion? I think the, the, the judiciary did very well with traffic offenses and seeing how do you handle these matters in a way that they do not clog up the justice system. Uh, but I think many of us can think of similar uh, petty offenses that clog up unnecessarily, uh, take up the time of police officers, clog up the justice system, and some of these people find their way to prisons. Uh, really, Amamamboga, who was found selling uh, 20 tomatoes without a license, uh, why is she in a, in a, a guest of the state? for three months, uh, for selling, being found with 20 tomatoes and maybe five months.